DinoFest is sponsored by Ameritech, Mayflower Group, NASA Lewis Research Center, the Paleontological Society, the School of Science at IUPUI Geology Department, in association with the Children's Museum of Indianapolis and the Indiana State Museum. With additional funding by and with special assistance from Welcome to DinoFest. We're here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of IUPUI. More importantly, we're here, or equally importantly, to celebrate the 151 years of dinosaur research in a unique way. DinoFest is the first celebration of its kind, and we're all delighted to be a part of it. I'm a dinosaur writer and groupie, and we're here among some of the greatest dinosaur researchers and scientists in the world. We'll be hearing from them and doing a great many things in the coming hour, a little more, including hearing from some sixth graders and from all of you in a variety of sites around the, around the country. So let me give you a brief rundown of what it is we're going to be doing today. This program is being aired live as we talk at WFYI Channel 20 in Indianapolis, but it's also being uplinked live to NASA's educational satellite network throughout North America. Among the many sites viewing in remote places, where it's not even afternoon perhaps, uh, let me run down a couple for you. School systems in uh, Robbinsdale, Minnesota, in Washington, D.C., particularly pleased to hear that Pryor Reservation School in Pryor, Montana is among our viewership. School systems in Cleveland, Chicago, and Detroit they're all a part of this network. We're going to have three question and answer sessions during this broadcast, and we invite questions which will be relayed to me in writing from all of you out there in our satellite network, and also from the sixth graders who are very kindly here amongst us. For those who are as asking questions from the theater right here, I ask you to look for Joetta, who I'll have stand up for a moment right now. She's here. Well, she will be here momentarily. And she will come around to you, and if you raise your hand, she'll take your question, bring it forward. So if you wait, wait for her there, she is in the back. All the television and satellite viewers can ask questions of the participants by calling 317-278-7800. The operators will field your calls, and they'll be relayed to me, and in turn to the audience and the scientists here. We also have a live feed going on, and we'll be go visiting them several times during the broadcast to the students at John Marshall Middle School who invo are involved in a dinosaur construction project of their own. And that's coming to us through the Ameritech fiber, opt net fiber Optic Network, and Ameritech is one of the gracious sponsors of this entire event. So that brings me now at last to the subject of this festivity, and that is the central question asked in Jurassic Park. What does Steven Spielberg do with all his money? <laughs> Actually not. That's the second question on everyone's mind. The first is, can we bring dinosaurs back? And the answer is no. So we could all go home now. However, we can find out an awful lot about dinosaurs by going to the fossil source. And among the things we'll be doing today is, we're going to go to the Children's Museum here in Indianapolis and their dinosaur dig exhibit and we'll have an interview with Jack Horner, one of the world's leading dinosaur paleontologists, who we'll also meet here. And he'll be with the museum's Carol Bartlett. We also find out about dinosaurs by bringing them back to museums and research institutions. And we'll go over to the IUPUI library, where many of these fossils are now housed. The Indiana State Museum curator, Ron Richards, and the Potomac Museum director, Hal Halverson, will be there. And they'll explain some of these fossil finds to you. We also found out, find out about dinosaurs through some high-tech means, and CAT scanning is one of them. We'll also we'll look at some uh, CAT scans of fossilized embryos on tape, and then we'll have some of the leading experts uh, analyze and describe some fossil finds through CAT scans of their own. 
We can put bones back together again. We learn about dinosaurs when we begin to reconstruct them, or try to. And that's where we'll go to the Indiana Public Schools once again and see how they're doing, building their dinosaur. We'll check in with them several times during this broadcast. We can also look for dinosaur DNA in amber. And that, of course, is the theme of Jurassic Park. It's a, an exciting frontier, and Diane Bellis is here to talk to you about that as well, one of the world's experts on fossils in amber. We can reconstruct dinosaurs' environments, find out the world in which they lived, the many worlds in which they lived. And we do that by studying the plant fossils that are found with the dinosaurs. And last, we can put dinosaurs back together again and make them alive. It costs us sometimes $65 million to do it in Jurassic Park. It's been done a little bit less expensively and rather effectively by the model makers, such as the folks at Dynamation. And you'll meet George Callison, a scientist at Dynamation. He'll describe the process by which they put those dinosaurs back together, and you'll see one of them moving as best a human can make a dinosaur move. Let me take you now to the Children's Museum, and we'll just have a paleontologist on hand, Jack Horner once again, to discuss how paleontologists find and dig up dinosaur bones. So let me turn you over to Carol Bartlett. Hi, I'm Carol Bartlett, and we're here at the Dinosaur Dig in the What If Gallery at the Children's Museum with a very special guest, Jack Horner, who digs up real dinosaur bones. Jack, tell us, how do you know where to look for dinosaurs? Well, that's a good question. Um, dinosaurs lived from about 100 or about 240 million years ago until about 65 million years ago. And when they died, they died in sediments of the same age. So all we have to do to find dinosaurs is go out into areas where the rock is exposed at the surface that's the right age. So if we're looking for a Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex lived 65 million years ago. So we would go look for rock that was deposited 65 million years ago and just walk around and hope we found it. What about our dinosaur dig here? Is this what it's really like when you find dinosaur bones? Have we done a good job of recreating that? Yes. This looks a lot like sandstone. And a lot of dinosaurs come out of sandstone. So yes, it looks, it looks very realistic. Great. I'm going to help them here in a minute. Good. What about the tools? You have basically the right tools. We usually use metal picks mm -hmm. and brushes. In other words, even smaller tools than what the kids yes. are using here. Yeah. It's a very tedious job to dig up a dinosaur, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. What do you do with the bones once you get them up? Do you take them out of the rock this clean? Um, I mean, how do you do that and get them back to the museum or the place where you want to study them? We clean them as, as best we can and then cover them with a glue, very thin glue substance, and then cover the bone with paper or tin foil, and then dig all the way around them, not all the way, but partially around it, and lay plaster of Paris, strips of plaster of Paris, wet plaster of Paris, over the top of it, just like a doctor does on broken arm. Mm -hmm. And then when that hardens, then you can pick the whole thing up and take it to the museum, and it won't get broken. The Tyrannosaurus rex that we collected a couple of years ago, the pelvic block, just the pelvis of the animal, uh, weighed 9,000 pounds when we, the plaster jacket that we took out. So you had a crane yes, to get that out. And then a big truck to and take it. A very big truck, yes. <laughs> What's the glue for? Well, the, the, when, the, when the fossil bone is exposed to the surface, to the air, it oftentimes gets very crumbly. And so the glue just sort of keeps everything intact until you can get it out of the plaster jacket and back to the museum. Do we have lots of places in the United States where you find fossilized dinosaur bones? Yeah. Um, most dinosaur bones come from, from the Rocky Mountain region, because that's where the right age rock is exposed. In the eastern United States, like here in Indiana, most of the right age rock has been eroded away. It's gone. And in some places, it's too deep. And don't want to dig down 2,000 feet to find a dinosaur. So 
mostly right around the Rocky Mountains is where the right age rock is exposed at the surface. So unfortunately, for all the kids who call us at the Children's Museum and think they found dinosaur bones or dinosaur teeth, there just aren't any here, right? Not in Indiana. Not no. in Indiana. Gee, that's a shame. Well, listen, Jack, would you like to get in and work with the kids a little bit? Certainly. OK, have at it. <laughs> Thank you, Lenore and Jack. Uh, you may not realize just how rare this is to see Jack Horner actually digging. <laughs> I know, having been out with him, what he does is he goes and finds a new kind of dinosaur, several specimens, beautiful ones, and then lets like, so everybody else do all the digging while he goes out and finds some more. So he's just making work for everybody else. That, however, is a rarity in paleontology. Most dinosaurs, of the 285 different kinds we know, are known from just a single tooth or a single bone. Leads to a lot of problems in naming dinosaurs. Leads in a lot of problems to reconstructing them. We're going to turn now to Lenore Tedesco from the IUPUI Department of Geology. She's out of the John Marshall Middle School, and let's see what the students there have done in building their dinosaur. Hi, Don. We're, as you said, at the John Marshall Middle School. I've got a group of eighth graders here, and we're going to try to reconstruct a dinosaur from only a few bones. With me here is Dr. Peter Dodson from the University of Pennsylvania, and he's with a group of students working on part of a skull. Thanks, Lenore. Well, we're having a great time here. We've got this beautiful dinosaur bone. It's, this jaw is 65 million years old, and, and it's, a, it's real. There's nothing fake here. And we're trying to figure out what kind of animal this is. And w w with these students here, we've already figured out. So, what, so we've already uh, decided what we've got here. What part of the jaw is this? The right jaw. Right it's, right, uh, it's the right jaw. It goes right up to the chin. It's complete. And uh, it, it's got one, one big shiny thing here, which is tooth. tooth. And this is kind of strange, but we, we have another. This, the, tooth is the, the, the tooth has come out here. Now, is it all just jawbone here? No. no. We've got one, two, three tail vertebrae. Uh, so that means this animal has died and really come, into, come apart into pieces. And we've got this other bone. I had to ask for help with that bone. Uh, what is that? Chevron. Chevron. It's a day. It's a bone that hangs down underneath the tail. And this was a plant eater, right? Oh, no. no. Man, this is a tremendous tooth. Look how long that root is and sharp and pointy. So we're going to work at uh, putting uh, putting this thing together and making some sense out of it. Right. We have uh, another group of students over here that are working with Dr. Dale Russell from uh, the National Museum of Canada, and they have what looks to me like a piece of a, an arm bone or something. Dr. Russell? Well, thank you very much. We have a remarkable fossil. It belongs to the same kind of animal that our other team was just looking at. So comparing a skull that you see over there that must be on the order of five feet long, we have an arm that belongs to the same animal here. And can you uh, tell us what, you're, what you think about it? Um, what do you think about this arm? Uh, you put me on the spot. I don't know. <laughs> well, how many... Um, what do you think of the claws? Are those are your claws of a... Uh, are they like your hands? Or how does it differ from your hands? The claws, they, the, the end part right here, they is used for um, clawing at other animals so they can uh, kill them and for uh, prey. So you think this animal is a meat eater? Yeah. And that matches with what we saw from the uh, bones over there that you have teeth in them of a flesh eating animal too. What do you think of this skull? Of this, uh, this well, it's pretty small for such a big animal. But the claws are real sharp. We were just discussing a few moments ago that this animal probably weighed as much as two medium-sized elephants put together. And I think that your arm is not much smaller than this arm. Uh, so this is, uh, your observation is really interesting. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, it's, uh, the, we determined that the, um, arm is extremely small. If this was on an elephant, we would think for a big, huge, uh, bull elephant, this would be a very small limb indeed. Um, what, do any, any of you uh, see anything in the color of it uh, or anything in the, uh, else in the shape of it that you find is interesting? I'm going to put you over on the spot now because they put me on the spot. Uh, it's brown. <laughs> they didn't think, I didn't think bones would be brown. Well, that's true. This one is stained probably with iron minerals. It's been buried a long time. Sometimes when the bones are on the ground, they turn white. They bleach in the sun, so they look white then. But actually, those bones contain um, 
real tissue the breakdown components of of material that was in the dinosaur when it was alive so when we study those amino acids that are left in it we can tell sometimes too whether it's a herbivore or a carnivore anybody go on to count your fingers and comment on what you see there in front of you well I only see two fingers and they seem kind of crooked that's a very good observation. Uh, the crookedness of the fingers goes way back deep into the ancestry of dinosaurs, and it appears in the very first ones, but this one is among the very last ones, and it only has two fingers. The most primitive dinosaurs start out with about four, so this one is another very advanced dinosaur with a very small hand, and it only has two fingers in it. We didn't know until a dinosaur was found in Canada uh, about 1910 that Tyrannosaurus actually had two fingers because the original type material of Tyrannosaurus did not have two, two fingers. Uh, well, what do you think, uh, what are your opinions on how this group is going to handle this reconstruction job? I think the group's going to do very well. They've already studied about dinosaurs at the beginning of the school year. They studied um, Jurassic Park for an entire six-week period. Um, they've drawn dinosaurs and um, they've done a really good job. So um, they're really kind of enthused about the entire thing. Thank you very much. We'll see how this one goes. Okay, Don, we're going to uh, keep working here and see what we can come up with and uh, take it away. We'll, we'll come back in a few minutes. Thanks, Lenore. It's good to hear from the real dinosaur experts, the students at the school. And it's also a pleasure to see uh, dinosaur pa paleontologists in their customary position on their knees. <laughs> uh, it's not just how they work. It's they're praying for someone to come along and help them dig it up. <laughs> you know, uh, Peter Dodson, one of the fellows you met there, has compiled a fascinating statistic that tells us how many dinosaur bones there are in museums all around the world. And it turns out that there are only, in all the history of digging up dinosaurs, 2,100 good skeletons of dinosaurs in museums all around the world. That's all we have to know dinosaurs. So fossils are to be treasured by all of us. They're hard to come by, they're hard to keep, they're hard to put together. And to illustrate that for us with some beautiful specimens right here at the museum at IUPUI, is one of the organizers of DinoFest, paleontologist Don Wolberg. So let me bring you to Don. Hi, Don. This is Don Wolberg with Ron Richards, not at the IUPI Museum, but the IUPI Library, which oddly enough appears to have become a museum. Ron, what do you think about all this? This is a really a spectacular event. What we have are fossils from all different time periods from around the world, and we've got not only that, but we've got the experts here that have described these and are, are really cutting edge experts in, in understanding dinosaurs today. Um, in Indiana, we're, we're kind of hampered. We don't really have dinosaur bearing strata. We do have big mammoths and mastodonts and things, but these really aren't dinosaurs. So this is a great opportunity for people in Indiana, central Indiana, really all of Indiana to move to the center of Indiana and learn about dinosaurs, see the reconstructions of these big beasts, see large fishes, uh, mammals, everything uh, reconstructed here, and to be able to talk to the experts. Uh, a tremendous um, uh, event here. One thing that is sort of in my mind, nowadays, uh, when we talk about the environment and the world and this and that, I think what people lack often is sort of a global uh, time perspective. And if you look at the vast, uh, the vastness of time on Earth, and you look at humankind is, has been here a very, a very small part of this time, and yet we're undergoing such rapid changes. We're, we're sort of changing most of our natural habitats today into human habitats. And so it might lend somebody uh, an attitude that maybe we shouldn't do this much. Maybe we don't have to restructure the entire world for just humans alone. So I think this time perspective can help in the long-term stewardship of our planet. And I see that as being a, a good value for everybody. Ron, um, we've talked about the kinds of displays here. Are there any displays that are actually from Indiana? You bet. We've got uh, in, the, in the lower level, actually in the upper level, we have uh, a lot of our uh, large undersea crinoids, uh, animals that flourished in Indiana. Uh, we have mastodont okay. skulls and mammoths quite a bit in the lower level, so please come in and see them. Wonderful. We're going to now show a tape of how we put together this huge hadrosaur behind us.
extremely important in the transit of the specimen that uh, each of the parts be carefully packed. For that purpose, we make use of this, uh, uh, this air foam bubble packing. And um, each part, even though it's a cast, again, is carefully packed in the uh, foam packing. Strung out along here are vertebrae, uh, the backbone. And each of these is nicely labeled, again, because they're casts. They're easier to handle and to mount. What we're looking at basically is going from up around the chest, further down uh, the animal, turning around into the uh, very tip of the tail, which is over here. The skull will mount um, up there. Um, at the tip of those two vertebrae in this string. So you have a good idea for how long the entire mount uh, actually is. Stretched out, this will be about 23 feet. What we're trying to accomplish here is arrange the skeletal parts in the appropriate manner so that the right pieces are attached to the right pieces. Um, Donna, are these real? These are casts, in part because the Chinese have seen the wisdom of trying to retain their uh, cultural, historical, scientific properties. But they have allowed American paleontologists and museums to collect and to uh, cast specimens. Um, since the animal isn't alive, you need a structure to hold it up. This animal lived about 80 million years ago in what is now uh, China. This animal will finally stand uh, 17 feet high and 23 feet long in life. It weighed about, about eight tons. We're with Hal Halverson. Uh, what's behind us, Hal? This is a juvenile duck-billed dinosaur called an Edmontosaurus. They uh, named this dinosaur Diane. It's named after Diane Tyson, a friend of the uh, Black Hills Institute that put it together. Uh, this is uh, not a full grown by any stretch of the imagination, but this one still stretches well over 12 feet long from head to tail. We don't often find intact whole specimens. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about how dinosaur parts are actually found and what it means to piece them back into a whole intact skeleton again. Well, back in the corner here, you can see that there is a, a bone bed. It has been excavated exactly the way it was found in the ground. All of the uh, bones were very carefully picked apart. They were uncovered. Uh, they were glued up and put into separate field jackets to bring back to the lab. Once that was accomplished, uh, all the measurements had been taken in the field for each of the bones. Now, to come up with a dinosaur of this size, you have to, in, in, a, in a bone bed like this, this is not what you would call an articulated dinosaur uh, field. How many animals are there actually in that bone bed? Well, in this bone bed here, there are several different animals. How do you know that? Well, uh, we have taken uh, some time here to number four bones just to show us an example of the varied sizes. These are all duck-billed dinosaurs, Edmontosaurus What's bones. What's number one, for no, instance? Number one is a very, uh, it's, a, it's an adult duck-billed dinosaur, and that's the shoulder blade. It's called a scapula. And if you look at number two, that shoulder blade is from a very small juvenile. Uh, these dinosaurs are getting Same very part, small. Though. Same part. Number three is still different size from the same a, part though. Same shoulder blade, and so is number four. Now some are from the left side, some are from the right side. So what we have to do in order to put together a dinosaur from this, this is not articulated, this is many dinosaurs. So we have to pick all these bones of the same size and of the right bone structure so that we can put together one dinosaur. How this, many how many hours would it take? to uh, clean up everything um, on that block and find all the other parts and recreate one skeleton. <laughs> this dinosaur here took 12 years to put together. 
because there are uh, so few amount of these small juvenile bones available. Mostly what we find are adult dinosaurs, but you don't find really old ones and you don't find really young ones. So you have to go for a long period of time uh, collecting the right size bones in order to be able to put one together. This uh, shoulder blade looked a lot like the ones that are over in the bone bed, and there was only one in that area. But there are hundreds of bones here that you have to match to get one dinosaur. For age um, and size as well, and also species, obviously. Apart from this specimen, what else is here, Hal? Well, there's all sorts of stuff. If you look right over here, I'm going to turn the head a little bit on this Diane. There is a three-dimensional large fish from about 70 million years ago called a Cephactinus. That's the very first uh, Cephactinus that has ever been put together three-dimensionally. This is a cast, but it, you can see by the sharp teeth on that creature, it was a formidable creature. And this is one of his arch enemies, the Mosasaur, that's right below him, looking like he's coming in for the attack. These are all composed of parts, skeletal parts. Over here as well, we have what appears to be an, an automated monster. Would you tell us a few things about that? And I know that it'll be explained in greater d detail later. Well, this is called a Deinonychus, and he is uh, put in a position where he has killed another dinosaur. And uh, uh, Dynamation, uh, the company that put this together, is uh, recreating these animals to look like what they would look like in their true habitat. This monster here has very sharp, long claws on its feet and on its front paws and its teeth. And you can see that it could make a a mess of a dinosaur in a short period of time. The uh, paleontologist who d discovered this animal, jo John, John Ostrom, is here at, uh, at the conference. We'll uh, now return to uh, Don. Um, take it away, Don. Don uh, why don't you get to work on that block at Matrix and see, we'll check in with you at the end of the hour, see if you can clean up that whole thing in the hour. Uh, you know, one of the jobs of the host is to make segues to make smooth connections between things that have no connection at all. And that's just what I'm about to do. So let's see how smooth I can make this. Uh, when we go to put dinosaurs back together, scientists are human, you know, uh, at best sometimes, and they make plenty of mistakes. Uh, with dinosaurs, and as many dinosaurs as we've named, almost as many names have been thrown out because the wrong head has been put on the dinosaur, a dinosaur has been accused of being a uh, an owl when it turns out to be a dinosaur. All kinds of mistakes are, have been made. But they're made within the context of trying to interpret the bones as best we can with a very limited set of information. And that's what scientists try so hard to do. But dinosaurs are special because they're not just the objects of science. They are the objects of fantasy, too. They are the monsters of our imagination. And it's no accident that the word in Chinese for dinosaur, kung lung, is the same word as it is for dragon. So particularly for children, dinosaurs exist in our imagination even more than they exist in reality. So let's take a look at something that, in the way of fantastic dinosaurs that children around here have done.
Well, as you can see, we have some pretty heated imaginations around here. We fortunately have an expert on hand to interpret these, and you can relax, it's not a psychiatrist. Uh, instead, it's Peter Larson, and Peter has uh, excavated the most complete Tyrannosaurus rex ever collected, uh, the infamous Sioux, a subject of some nightmare, at least for Peter these days. Uh, and Peter is the proprietor, the president of the Black Hills Institute, and he's got some of the drawings right here with him to interpret. Peter. Well, as everyone knows, dinosaurs are for children. For those of us who never grew up, we call ourselves paleontologists. Um, the, the interesting thing about dinosaurs is that they were really monsters that once lived. So we like to use our imaginations, just as we did when we were kids, to try to think of fantastic things. And uh, some of these drawings are really neat and really interesting. And we have one here, if we can see it, uh, where the dinosaur has two heads and three legs. And one here, where we have four legs and three heads. And another very interesting specimen here, where we have multiple heads and multiple legs. Now, uh, one of the things that we have to do as scientists is restrain our imagination a little bit, because we're limited on how we reconstruct dinosaurs into what things are possible. Uh, uh, multiple or dinosaurs with more limbs than four would be something that was really unusual and really irregular, because they come from animals which only had four legs. So we sort of have to restrict ourselves to, to, to reconstructing dinosaurs with four legs and only with one head. Now, we could have a dinosaur with only two legs, as we see some dinosaurs in Lake Cretaceous, like Tyrannosaurus, actually had reduced their arm to something very small and possibly could have lost that arm uh, in the end. But we're sort of restricted as to how we can interpret these, these animals. So we unfortunately can't make dinosaurs with two heads. Thank you, Peter. Well, you know, we can only make politicians with two heads. Uh, <laughs> one thing to point out, we see in many of these drawings that's a little different from what scientists know to be the reality, is that we picture a lot of things living in this dinosaur world, and indeed they did. Things that flew, things that were in the sea, the pterosaurs in the air, and the plesiosaurs in the water. But those were not dinosaurs. And if the dinosaurs were here, they'd be saying, please get us right. We're the ones that lived on land. We're the ones that walked with our legs underneath us. Those are the dinosaurs. And of course, they're all gone with the exception of their direct descendants, the birds. I'm going to open the floor for questions, both from our satellite audience and from you here in the audience here. But let me first of all introduce our panel, which is something I didn't get around to doing before. And I'll do that with a comment that was made by uh, President Kennedy long ago. He had his cabinet together, all the great politicians and, and educators of his time. And he said, we've never had such a distinguished talented group of people together at one dinner since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Well, it's a particularly appropriate comment here because Thomas Jefferson was one of America's first great paleontologists. And we have some of today's great paleontologists right here at this table. You've already met Peter Larson. Sitting next to him is Philip Curry. Dr. Curry is the world's expert on meat-eating dinosaurs. He's perhaps the only person in the world who can identify any dinosaur, meat-eating dinosaur, from a single tooth. Maybe we'll put him to the test today. Next to him is Bruce Rothschild. Uh, you may have read about Bruce as a dinosaur doctor in Discover Magazine. He is a doctor, uh, a medical doctor, but with a particular interest in fossils. And he looks at dinosaur bone and unusual dinosaur bones that show dinosaurs had arthritis and cancer and all kinds of other injuries and diseases. Jack Horner sitting next to him. You've already met on tape. Now you see live. Uh, Jack perhaps needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. He is, uh, <laughs> he is a model for us all because he never graduated college. And, and yet he is one of the world's foremost dinosaur researchers. And Jack has discovered the first dinosaur eggs and babies found in North America. He's done uh, very important research on duckbill dinosaurs, on the evolution of all dinosaurs and he's responsible for excavating the second most complete Tyrannosaurus rex ever found. Uh, seated next to Jack is Diane Bellis. Diane is a uh, geochemist, an expert on fossils and amber, now does policy work in Washington, D.C. And seated at the end is a graduate student, Jody Smith of Jack Horner's. Jody is a self-professed computer nerd. We would call him computer whiz. 
He's a fellow who specializes in morphing, as he'll describe and show to you later. He has a unique talent for bringing dinosaurs back to life and mixing them with dinosaur scientists. I'll, I'll leave it there, and we'll see how that happens. So let me take first some of the questions that have come to us already from the satellite. As we're doing it, Joetta will move among you with her microphone. If you have a question here, raise your hand. Joetta will come around to you, bring the microphone up to you, and wait to say your question until she's up to you with the microphone. So let me throw a couple of the questions that we've gotten here out to this group and see what they have to say. Robbie from Fishers, Indiana says, how dinosaurs were born. So let me ask Jack, how dinosaurs were born? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. Um, dinosaurs hatched out of eggs. That's how they were born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alisa from Danville, Indiana says, who made dinos? Jack, I think this follows up on the earlier question. <laughs> <laughs> Mother and father dinosaurs. <laughs> He's getting all the tough ones. Okay, we have a question here. Let's see if you can get the mic over. What was the first dinosaur found? What was the first dinosaur found? Anyone want to raise their hand here? It's a well behaved bunch. Nobody volunteering here? Okay, well, let's have a little argument then. I'll, gi I'll give you the textbook answer. I think, which is that the first dinosaur found was tooth of iguanodon identified by Gideon Mantell around 1820 in England. Actually, that's not correct. Actually, that's not correct from two points of view. Uh, <laughs> well, forget it. Uh, while he was happily married, he gave the credit to his wife. After the divorce, there was another story. But I think, ja <laughs> <laughs> but I think Jack has a third. Yeah, but I don't know whether we should go into this one or not. It was the distal end of a femur found in New Jersey mm -hmm. back in the early 1700s. Yes, and it got an unusual anatomical it name. Got a which very was... unusual name, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in the answer to that, you'll have to research that yourselves. <laughs> of course, the, the point to be made here is that people were finding dinosaurs for centuries, long before they knew what they were. In fact, there are references to them in 13th century Chinese literature. And you can even find it back in Roman days that people were finding these extinct giants and not knowing what to make of them. Maybe that's the reason why we call dinosaurs dragons. Another question from here. How would you go about finding cancer and diseases in dinosaurs? I think we know who to ask. <laughs> well, the first thing you have to know is what the normal dinosaur bone looks like. And once somebody has identified a bone that is abnormal, then it's a matter of trying to uh, decide what, the type, what could cause that type of change. And once you've decided what could cause that type of change, then you have to determine uh, what it would look like or how you can prove it. It's not just saying, well, I think, therefore, it is. Uh, it's a matter of, for, of testing it. That is, forming a hypothesis looking at a way to, uh, to test the hypothesis. And we'll get into that with some examples a little bit later today. OK. Another question from over here? She changed her mind. OK. Next Scientists do that all the time. <laughs> they don't admit it always. How can you tell what kind of dinosaur it is? I know you can tell it by the teeth, but how do you tell what it is? Okay, how do, how do you identify a dinosaur when you've dug it up? Phil. That's right. Um, it, it's, it's almost like identifying human beings. Very often when you look at humans or if you look at uh, a dog of a certain breed or something like that, they all look the same initially. But as you get familiar with them and you understand them better and better, then you start to recognize that there are differences. And it's the same with a lot with dinosaur bone. When you get a lot of experience, you can go out in the Badlands and you can see that the leg bone of a duckbill dinosaur looks very different than the leg bone of a Tyrannosaurus. And uh, by honing in your um, expertise and your experience, over the years you learn to identify more and more bones in the body because they're all different for every animal. Got some more over here. Good, good group. Where did the first egg come from? Where did the first egg come from? The first dinosaur egg? That's a, good, that's a very good question. 
Now, do you mean discovered <laughs> or, or oh, what, what animal and, yeah? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're getting an answer from Terry, who's a, an expert on dinosaur eggs and preparing them. If, if you all uh, can turn a camera back to Terry for a moment. He's come all the way from England to answer this question. A, a dinosaur that roamed Europe and uh, it laid its eggs near Marseille. Uh, what was it called? Come on, somebody, help me out here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we're talking about uh, Hypsilosaurus eggs. Hypsilosaurus, that's right. right? Sauropod eggs, a big four-legged dinosaur, laid a fairly good cannonball-sized egg. Terry's answering a slightly different question than you asked, but he's doing a good job of it, which is, <laughs> which is what the first dinosaur eggs ever discovered. And they were discovered early in the 20th century, I believe, in, in, in southern France. I think Jack's been to, to look at them. And the first nest of dinosaur eggs was found in Mongolia by the real Indiana Jones, Roy Chapman Andrews, in 1924, I think. And we're just beginning to really figure out who laid those eggs. Yes? Stand up, please. Have you ever had any problems trying to find what the dinosaur was? Let's ask Peter about that. <laughs> <laughs> To, uh, to find where a dinosaur was, um, it, it takes a, a lot of library research and trying to find, as Jack mentioned when he was out at the, uh, the Children's Museum, that uh, you have to know what age of rocks to look in. And a lot of times we can find a fragment of a dinosaur, a little piece of a dinosaur down in the wash with a cliff face in front of us, and we have a very difficult time sometimes tracing that piece back to where that came out of the hillside and trying to find that, uh, that uh, dinosaur. Um, there are a few fossils that I go back to and pick up little pieces on the ground every year, but I can never find exactly where it's coming out. Uh, so sometimes it's very difficult to find where that fossil is coming out of the ground. Yes? Here from Pryor, Montana. Do you want me to go ahead and ask it? or do Sure, you go ahead. Okay, this is from Travis in Pryor, Montana. How did they find the DNA and RNA to make Jurassic? Okay, let's try this one on. Uh, Bruce, you want to try? Jurassic Park, uh, the expert uh, was sitting next to me, but uh, that the theory was that it was taken from a mosquito that had allegedly, or from an insect that had allegedly uh, bitten a dinosaur. Well, whether what's found in the mosquito represents the last meal, and if the last, or uh, another biting uh, uh, insect, if that last meal happened to be a dinosaur, there might be some uh, degenerated or uh, disrupted DNA left. And the hypothesis was that you could make up a dinosaur from that type of material. Well, uh, were it so, I'm not sure we'd really want to. Um, I have enough trouble working in the, uh, the basement of the Museum of Natural History looking at the, the uh, uh, tyrannosaurs over my shoulder, much less wanting to clone one. It's a, it's a complicated question. Actually, we'll get a little more evidence during this broadcast when we talk to Diane about things found in amber, and we talk to Jack and others about DNA found in in bones. Right now we're going to have to cut short this question session, but I remind people there'll be two more, so you get a chance to ask your question then. And please keep sending in your questions if you're at a remote site. Right now we're going to switch us all over to back to, uh, to check up on how the students at uh, the school are doing and putting their dinosaur together. Hi, Don. We're back at the John Marshall Middle School, and actually we're making a lot of progress. The students have decided we're working with a T-Rex skeleton here, and uh, they've drawn quite a lot of it. We have many groups of students, and they're working in groups. We've got one group working with uh, Dr. Dotson, working on the skull, and they've come quite, quite a long way. Got another group working on the vertebrae. Dr. Uh, Russell's working down by the leg, I guess. And we've got our artist, Joe Lippman, working with a group of them on the vertebrae. Um, Joe, you want to tell us how you're doing? Yeah, we're doing real good. We've got uh, the whole T-Rex. And uh, uh, like I say, everybody's working on a different section of the T-Rex. We're uh, coloring in the hip area and coloring the femur and some of the other bones different colors to differentiate them. Uh, we've got the whole tail laid out. What are they working on down here? These guys are working on... Uh, tail vertebrae and the chevrons in the in the tail so what's going on with the scaling? You got all 
It's scaled pretty close. We started off with the skull, with a four-foot skull, and scaled the rest of the animal to the skull. Uh, so these guys know what they're doing as far as scaling goes. We know that the femur is the same length as the skull, and the ilium is the same length. So we've got those basic things done, and now we're uh, trying to get all the bones laid out here and filled in and colored in. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Got it almost fully colored in. You know how many vertebrae are supposed to be in the tail here? Forty-six. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, it looks like okay. we're doing, doing real well. Let's go check on what they're doing over by the skull. Thanks, Joe. We'll come over here, and we're going to talk to Dr. Peter Dodson. And geez, they've done a great job with the skull. Good art work. And what have you got here? Well, what do you think, Lenora? Are you frightened yet? Meet up with well, them. we're we're doing real well here. We um we happen to uh, these these guys are really prepared. They've studied. They've read Jurassic Park. They've studied dinosaurs. We came up with this nifty model, which is helping our work just a little bit. Uh, one thing we are concerned about is how many teeth was the right number. Uh, what was the right number? Uh, fifteen. Fifteen teeth. So we've got fifteen teeth drawn in here, and uh, uh, where uh, where's the eye? The eyes right there, and we've got these other openings. Where's the nose? There. Yeah, so, uh, and what do we decide this thing was for? We had to redesign this. There's uh, part of the two opening. Um, the, it was all backwards, so we had to return it around because it's uh, try something. I can't remember. And it had two openings, so we had to redo it to make the two openings the right way. And that's where the muscles that close the jaws uh, ran from there down to the lower jaw, and you can bet those muscles are strong, do you think? Yeah. So uh, we're real happy with the way this is looking now. We're, we're, we're right proud of our work. You're right proud of it. All right. Well, good. Any other, so what else you got to do to finish up on the, on the head? You need to, you got the neck all attached on there and the vertebrae in the neck going right? Well, I think connecting the uh, skull to the neck is just about the next uh, job to do. So one end is going to meet the other. All right, well, that's great. Let's just wander over here and see what the folks working on the leg are doing. We'll come over. We sort of abandoned the arm for a little while, but I guess we'll get back to that in a minute. And, Dale, we've got the femurs going pretty well. Yeah, the femurs are about done. We're looking at the stomach line now. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the uh, cubic boot here serving as a tripod for these animals. Um, we've discussed the possibility that Tyrannosaurus um, crouched in wind-blown tree, uh, fallen trees, and um, sat on their pubic boot, and with the eyes on top of their head, which the other team is working on there, they could look above the brush and see what's coming up for dinner. Ah, so they were basically hunting then, stalking things that are walking by. Yeah, I, we don't think that he was nearly as uh, uh, unaware of what was going on as first glance might suggest. No, I don't think he was either. All right. So oh. we had a little discussion here, too, about how the Tyrannosaur uh, protected himself when he was fighting a horned dinosaur like a Triceratops. Can you remember how that worked? Uh, we were well, he, he sat and, like, kind of blended in with the trees and waited for his prey and then just caught him off guard because they couldn't tell. It just looked like a whole bunch of logs. And he just jumped out. He, like, tried to hide, but he's there. All right. Well, Don, we're going to uh, keep on working, and I guess we'll see you again in a little while, and hopefully by then we'll have a finished dinosaur, or at least be a heck of a lot more close. Take it away. Thank you, Lenore, and good luck to you and the students. You're doing a great job, and to Peter and Dale as well. You can see how tough it is to put a dinosaur back together. It's just as hard, if not harder, to take one out of the ground. In fact, it's done just the same way with the backbreaking labor it's been done since dinosaurs were first found, with picks and shovels and... Uh, all kinds of equipment that's very basic. So it's a very low-tech science in many regards. But a little of the backbreaking labor has been saved of late with some high-tech ingenuity. And that involves using some of the same techniques that are used to check us out when we go to the hospital. We've got a little videotape presentation that shows you how CAT scanning has worked with dinosaur science to unveil some things that aren't always obvious about fossils. In the What If exhibit at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, a rare find is on display. Currently on loan from the Indianapolis Museum of Art is a dinosaur egg dating back to the Cretaceous period. The egg is from a protoceratops, 
a dinosaur which weighed around 80 pounds, about the size of a German shepherd. This egg was one of several found in the Gobi Desert in the 1920s on an expedition led by Roy Chapman Andrews. Oh, the history behind this one is, is wonderful. Um, the American Museum of Natural History in the 1920s did an expedition to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. And um, what they were actually looking for was the um, history of mankind. They were looking for early human remains. And they were also looking for any fossils they might find. Fortunately, they found the dinosaurs. I, I guess it's an abundant place for dinosaur fossils. And um, no um, early human ancestors there. But uh, now we know their, their origins in Africa. But uh, they found the eggs. In fact, that was probably the most spectacular thing that came out of that um, expedition. Um, they just happened to find a cache of several eggs. Um, Roy Chapman Andrews led the expedition and um, came across a nice little nest area. They were laid in a circular pattern. And um, in fact, the animal that these come from, it's um, Protoceratops Andrews eye. So it's named after Roy Chapman Andrews. And um, we happen to be lucky that um, IMA, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, has been very cooperative. They've loaned this egg to us. In fact, they originally got it from Roy Chapman Andrews' widow. Um, it was a gift to the IMA. And the collaboration between the two museums has been great. And um, that's why we're able to show it. Through a cooperative effort between the Children's Museum and Indiana University Hospitals, the 70 to 85 million year old egg was carefully packed and taken to IU Hospital's radiology department. Here, sophisticated imaging technology was used in an attempt to get a glimpse into the Earth's ancient past. Associate Curator for the Children's Museum, Dallas Evans, explains what they hope to find with the use of the CAT scan. Well, to be honest, if I were um, basing my ideas on reality, just a gray mass, probably very little, because um, dinosaur eggs with embryonic material is pretty rare. On hand to observe the arrival of the egg at University Hospital, were a group of sixth graders from Indianapolis Public School number 61. Prior to its arrival at the hospital, the egg was placed in acid-free tissue paper and bubble packing. To prevent staining of the egg's surface by skin oils, cloth gloves were used to remove and place the egg on the scanning table. In charge of the scan was Dr. Ethan Brownstein, professor of radiology and adjunct professor of anthropology at IUPUI. We have some experience uh, in uh, working with Egyptian mummies, uh, but uh, this is probably the oldest thing that we've CAT scanned ever, and uh, it's certainly the first dinosaur egg that I've CAT scanned. We're now putting the egg into the scanner, and we're going to do a preliminary x-ray of the entire egg just to see where we can localize to do the best scans to see if there's an embryo inside. We're going to be comparing these images with previous images obtained of dinosaur eggs, not on CAT scans, but of plain radiographs. In this particular egg, we're actually able to see some of the shards of broken shell, which have been pushed into the middle of the egg by uh, whatever shattered the egg to begin with, as well as seeing the stony matrix inside. We saw findings similar to those which represent a real embryo in another egg, but since this is uh, uh, a matter of limited experience on my part, I can't conclusively say whether we found one or not, but certainly we found enough to suggest that there might be an embryo in this egg, and we weren't even really expecting that. Everybody thinks in terms of CAT scans and x-rays in hospitals just for medical imaging, but uh, I think this is a, a tremendous example of the use of imaging technology for other uh, scientific or intellectual endeavors, uh, whether it be Egyptian mummies or whether it be dinosaur eggs, uh, we do have this technology to offer, particularly in an academic setting, and uh, we look forward to collaborating with people from other uh, departments of the university or from other institutions who have uh, uh, reason to think that this type of technology will be useful to them. Well, thank you. We've got have the good fortune to have two scientists who have pioneered the use of this technology on dinosaur eggs, and they are the two scientists who first discovered dinosaur eggs and embryos in North America, Jack Horner, of course, and Phil Curry. Uh, before we go any further, Phil presented something very interesting here the other day, mentioning to all of us that perhaps this fabled dinosaur nest, the first one ever found containing protoceratops eggs, doesn't contain protoceratops eggs. Could you explain that, Phil? Well, it's interesting that um 
they found so many different types of eggs and yet they took the simple approach. They thought that uh, because Protoceratops was the most common type of animal at that particular site, that all of these eggs probably belonged to Protoceratops. So you actually ended up with eggs of different sizes, different shapes, and, and different uh, textures on the outside. One of the nests of these so-called Protoceratops eggs had a theropod or carnivorous dinosaur next to it. And they assumed that uh, the theropod was in fact uh, stealing eggs from that nest and was eating them when he got caught in a sandstorm. And it's a very imaginative story, of course, but there it was, the theropod right next to the nest. And so they called the theropod oviraptor, which means egg thief. Now, a couple of years ago when we were working in China, we ran across uh, the same kind of eggs in another nest, and we found another oviraptor skeleton associated with that nest. But this time when we excavated it, we found that the oviraptor was in fact straddling over the nest and was in fact sitting on the nest. And then it seemed very obvious to us that um, if the oviraptor was in fact raiding a nest and it got trapped in a sandstorm, it's not going to stay in the sand for the sake of a little bit of food. It's going to move on. On the other hand, uh, if it's protecting its own nest, it might just stay there long enough to get buried deeply enough in sand that it does get smothered. So it makes more sense. So we now have a second occurrence of the same kind of thing. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what you found through CAT scanning about dinosaur eggs and embryos? We got into CAT scanning originally because uh, we found dinosaur eggs in southern Alberta. They're quite similar, actually, to the ones that Jack Horner was finding down in Montana. And we knew there were embryos in them. Uh, yet these were complete eggs, and consequently we wanted to see what was going on inside of them. Uh, we had limited success in initially. Uh, we think that we were doing the wrong thing. This is back in 1987 when we first tried it. And uh, now that the equipment is actually more sophisticated and our knowledge of using CAT scans is, is better than it was, uh, we're going back and redoing a lot of the eggs that we tried at that time and found nothing in because it turns out that they do have embryos inside of them. Uh, we also got involved in it uh, in terms of our Chinese eggs, which uh, there's lots of material from northern China uh, in fact, thousands of eggs have been discovered, and yet they seem to be all barren. Um, some had reported dinosaur embryos inside of those eggs. We CAT scanned those and found that, in fact, they did not. Um, I became very skeptical, in fact, that uh, any of the Asian eggs had embryonic material in until last year when suddenly a lot of new material started appearing from central China, which definitely has embryos in it, and it does show up on CAT scans, too. Now, Jack is, I believe, the first person to name a dinosaur ever from an embryo. You name a dinosaur from the best specimen you have avail available of it. And Jack named a dinosaur, if I'm right, from a specimen found inside an egg. Is that right? Well, kind of. We, <laughs> That's as close we, as I'm going to get. We have older individuals of it, too. <laughs> but it, it was the first, it was certainly, well, it was the first dinosaur embryo found, as far as I know certainly identified anywhere in the world, and it, it was in its fetal position. And we, we tried CAT scanning also, and found that, that the CAT scanner at the time, this was 1984, the CAT scanner just didn't have the resolution to, so that we could see the difference between the, between the bone and the rock. But as Phil says, the CAT scanner, the resolution is getting much better now and and we are beginning to see in the new cat scans we're doing of eggs we are be beginning to get to a point where we can decipher something in the eggs although it's very difficult to tell exactly what bones we're looking at is it ever possible to know what kind of dinosaur you have just from looking inside an egg um, well depends on what you mean by what kind. I mean, it, identifying the species inside of an egg is very difficult because the babies change. When, it, when a dinosaur hatches out of its egg, the baby changes. The shape of its skull changes, and, and sometimes the length of each bone changes, so it's, it's really hard. It's, the baby looks, it's like mammals and birds. Baby mammals and baby birds look very different than their adult counterparts, so it's very hard to tell from the embryo what the adult will look like. Now let me ask Bruce a question, if I can, which is what, what you foresee in the future or what technology is available that hasn't been applied yet, what we could be learning from CAT scans about fossils. 
Well, as far as technology that has not been applied, I, I think that's uh, one of the issues that uh, as soon as the technology becomes available, we, we tend to try it. We've even looked at magnetic resonance imaging, and it actually does work for uh, evaluation of uh, ancient uh, bones. I think there are several things we can do with uh, three-dimensional imaging. We can get uh, views of bones from uh, different perspectives and even from the inside out. We can uh, change the uh, equipment uh, registration, that is to change the image perspective and see the brain case, the inside, what the brain, shape of the brain was without actually cutting out the, uh, cutting up the skull. With dinosaur eggs, with so many being barren, I think it's a nice technique to identify those eggs, which preparation will yield uh, useful bones to, uh, to indicate what the embryo actually looked like. I think one of the big problems we have is we, have we don't have enough people trained in time for preparation of everything, and so it would help us in selecting those uh, specimens which would be better for preparation. But we don't have to go quite to CAT scan. The CAT scan helps because it gives us a cross-sectional image. And a cross-sectional Im image is very helpful because we don't like to damage our uh, uh, specimens if we can avoid it. But sometimes it becomes important. And the question that was asked earlier, can, I, I'd like to answer now with the uh, examples that we have on the side table. And if we could bring those up for a moment. Uh, a number of years ago, while we were visiting Dale Russell, uh, you, the specimen that you see on your right was, uh, was very prominent to my eyes. And this is the, uh, one of the phalanges, or uh, uh, toe bones, of a ceratopsian horn dinosaur. And there was a bump that didn't belong there. And so when you see a pathology like that, the question is to uh, form a hypothesis as what caused, could have caused it. It could have been infection, but there was another possibility. There's something called a stress fracture. And if you look at the specimen on your left, that's the, uh, this section, this specimen we actually did cut, and you can see that there's a line running through just at the area where the pointer is, through the, into that area of uh, bump, and the bump is a callus, an area of healing from a, from a stress fracture. Now this is on the, on the uh, hind leg of a, of a horned dinosaur, and I guess he uh, kind of uh, threw a temper tantrum for whatever reason and started stamping his foot, and if you do it over and over again, it's sometimes you get a, a stress fracture. Well, in looking at this, you start seeing, not only do you see the fracture, but you start seeing independently the shape and size of the bone. And we realize that the bones in rest in, uh, that, were de that are coming out of the ground 65 million years old still have intact uh, tissue structures. And if we could have this, the photograph, what we will show you is something that I find really phenomenal, and that is the histology, the actual uh, appearance of the bone hasn't changed. It's still there, even the tissue is there biochemically, immunologically, which you'll be hearing more about. But more importantly, when we look at a, a, a thin section of the bone, we start seeing something very, very interesting. And in the pictures that you'll be seeing in a moment, uh, the w picture on, on your right is a dinosaur. It's, this is a, a, a courtesy of a Claudia Barreto, and this is some work that she's done looking at the ends of bone where joints occur, the articulating surfaces of, of uh, bones. And here she found very interestingly that the shape at the top, and this is uh, electron microscopy, and the shape at the top looks identical to that on the left side of the film, and at higher magnification, the same is shown in the bottom frames. Well, the question is, what is a dinosaur, and who, what is it related to? Uh, to my eyes, the uh, film, the illustrations on left and right look pretty, uh, quite similar and quite different from what they look like in mammals, and a bit different than what you see in reptiles. So dinosaurs come down to what is a dinosaur? I should say the image on your left is from a chicken. And so if you're going to say, is, the, is this information for the birds? Uh, <laughs> is that the, there are, you know, did there, did, are dinosaurs extinct? Well, those who are joining us for the Dino Fest tonight uh, may be dining on one of their relatives. Back to you, Don. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Uh, we learn an awful lot about dinosaurs even without the aid of CAT scans and microscopes. And it often takes just some very talented detective work. And there's a great story that comes to my mind, but it came first to the mind of Jack Horner 
and that has to do with Myasaura and his discoveries about one particular dinosaur and its social behavior, all from analyzing a nest and the dinosaurs that lived in and around that nest. I wonder if I can ask Jack to... Well, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I think a few of us don't know all that you found out just by looking at that nest. Well, there was actually a lot of, a lot of nests. Uh, what we were able to find was, was a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of nests on a single horizon, on what appeared to be a single time horizon. And these individual nests contained either eggs, um, up to 20 eggs or so. Some of the nests contained baby dinosaurs, which with some of them we could see would fit back in the egg just barely. So they were, they were probably very close to ones that had just hatched out of their eggs. And we found other nests that contained babies that were larger than what would have hatched out of the eggs. And initially, when the discovery was made, it was, it was suggested from the evidence that, that the baby dinosaurs may have actually been altricial and stayed in their nests and actually been cared for. Um, and later on, we were able to get information that, that substantiated that. Um, but the baby dinosaurs that we found the hatchlings were about 18 inches long, and the larger individuals in the nests were about three and a half feet long. So it looked like the baby dinosaurs had stayed in their, that hatched out of their eggs about 18 inches long and grew to three and a half feet while they still remained in the nest. And of course, if they're in the nest, uh, the suggestion would be that that they did not get out of their nest and go somewhere, get food and come back, that they actually were brought food. And uh, what I believe, the evidence that actually substantiated this was evidence from their knee joints. We actually took thin sections again, looked at those what we call epiphyseal surfaces, the actual kind of bone at the end, end of their joints, at, like at their knee, and found that there was tremendous amounts of calcified cartilage. And calcifi when bone grows, it starts out as cartilage, and then calcifies and then ossifies and becomes the bone that we know now. Calcified cartilage is not very strong and an animal, if their bone is all calcified cartilage, can't really walk. And we see the same kind of, we see that kind of bone in altricial birds. If you ever look in a nest, you see like robins or something sitting in their nest. You, don't, you never see the baby robins hopping up and down and jumping around and going for walks and stuff. They just sit there. And they do that because they can't go anywhere. And it appears that the baby myosaurs had the same situation. They really couldn't get up and go anywhere. So it seemed to be pretty good proof that the baby dinosaurs were fed by their parents. Now, after they were three and, about three and a half feet long, their bone ossified, and they were able to leave the nest. And then, of course, we have further evidence to suggest that at least the duckbill dinosaurs and probably the horned dinosaurs as well uh, all lived in some kind of social group after the nesting period, that they actually traveled in gigantic groups. We have, there's a, sitting here in front of me, these odd looking things right here are dinosaur eggs from China. And I understand that some of them have actually produced embryonic remains and the embryonic remains appear to be uh, appear to be theropods or carnivorous dinosaurs, possibly even some kind of tyrannosaur. Um, be interest, very interested in seeing all the CAT scans that come from this stuff. I'm, I'm in fact, I'm. It is the oddest shaped egg I've ever seen, and real interested in knowing how the dinosaur gets itself wrapped up in here. <laughs> Well, this, by the way, these are the biggest, or among the biggest dinosaur eggs ever found. This is as big as a dinosaur egg gets. And when you think about how big dinosaurs got, as big as his auditorium in some cases, they had to grow awfully fast and awfully big from a fairly small egg, even though that is a pretty jumbo AAA job there. There are, there are actually some eggs from South America that, that are quite a bit larger than this, very thick-shelled. Really? Um, it looked 
to be about a gallon and a half volume, which is a pretty good size egg. Yeah. So omelets for everyone here. Um, I'm going to switch the subject a little more to uh, something else found in Jurassic Park, and that is amber. In Jurassic Park, of course, this becomes the source of rebuilding dinosaurs. Uh, but amber itself can tell us a lot about, the, and the insects within the amber tell us a lot about dinosaur environments, about the world as it once was, even if it doesn't bring back a dinosaur for us. This is a subject of considerable research on the part of uh, Dr. Diane Bellis, and I'm going to ask her to take it away and tell us a little about her work. Thanks. Um, amber is just fossil resin. Now, you've all seen pitch flowing out of a pine tree. As it comes out of the tree and is exposed to the air and to the sunlight, it starts to harden. It polymerizes the small molecules in, that make up the more liquid resin, start to connect to each other and make long chains and then cross. As it drips down the tree trunk, it can pick up whatever organisms might be climbing up the tree and things can fly in it with the wind, dust, pollen, tree parts. Uh, I think over on the side there we have a couple of insects that have been stuck in the amber as it came out. That's a cricket. Uh, by the way, these specimens were loaned to us by Sue Hendrickson, thankfully. They're very, they're just exquisite. The, the tissue uh, in this resin has become the subject of a great deal of research. There, there's another insect over there. The insects, in some cases, you see that are stuck in the amber. You can see damage. They've probably been half stuck in and half out, and predators have come and chomped on them while they were there. There are also cases with small lizards, frogs. Uh, once the uh, whatever's going to get stuck in the resin is stuck, sometimes the tree will produce more resin and trap air or water. Um, the, the resin then probably, we're not sure why some of it gets preserved and why some doesn't. Some of it, that has to do with the chemistry. There is the thought that maybe it fall, has to fall into water in order to be preserved and to be buried by clay usually. Most resin, um, amber that we know is between 50 and 15 and 40 million years old. But quite conveniently, um, amber is found during the last about, uh, see the, goes back to 120 years, so the last, uh, from if the dinosaurs were there, 65, we can cover and get information about what was going on in the environment for the latest part, at least, of the dinosaur's existence. When the, um, the problem with some of the resin, like that we see here and we saw the insects in, is that we can't ex tell the age very well. When it falls onto the ground, it floats in water, and so it usually washes downstream and then gets buried in sediments. And certainly we can tell how old the sediments are, but those sediments tend to be moved. And unfortunately, the sediments, um, the amber that has the big bus bubbles and the best insect specimens, we really don't know how, how old the amber is. I have found, and it's quite unusual, red, not that it's red, red's quite not unusual color, actually, though most of it's this color. There's red, blue, green, brown, black. I found some red Cretaceous amber that's in place. It's, some of it's actually in a petrified conifer tree. And there are samples around the tree. And there also happen to be three different kinds of duck-billed dinosaurs buried in the same quarry. So that's interesting because we know exactly, we know that what's in the resin was there when the dinosaurs were buried. Once you find amber or resin that has bubbles in it, and I think there's a, oh, oh this is a leaf amber track, you know, you get all sorts of things collected in it. But one of the more interesting, I think, is the bubbles. Um, once you have a good piece of amber that has bubbles in it, you crush that. I don't know if you can see them very clearly. These happen to be pretty, pretty small ones. Some of them you see very clearly. They're uh, maybe a centimeter across, and they actually, some of them have water in them. You crush that into a high vacuum and use chemical techniques to analyze the air which gives you probably at least a fingerprint, an indication. It may not be exactly the air that was there when the dinosaurs were there, but we happen to like to believe that what is in there can be interpreted. Now, the question of Jurassic Park, uh, Bruce stole some of my thunder, but I think there is no doubt that the best preserved DNA, the most, the most likely place to find DNA preserved for any length of time is in amber. The mere preservation of this stuff suggests that it hasn't been exposed to very high temperatures or, or pressures. 
So we know, and that's what it requires for DNA to hang around for a long time. Um, in this specimen, you can actually see a gnat, which we would like, or a tick, I keep calling it a gnat. It's a tick, we like to think he's pretty fat because he's been sucking on something. Again, the problem is he's probably, at the oldest, only 40 million years old. Uh, we do know that amber occurs in sediments, like I said, that go back to 120 million, what well, goes back to 300, there are probably trees around that produced enough resin to trap air after about 120 million. That, those specimens haven't been found yet. Uh, there's a lot more interest in amber research now that we know DNA uh, can be found. And I think that in the future, uh, we will find that Cretaceous amber that has Cretaceous DNA, probably not dinosaur DNA, because you'd have to find the bug that bit the dinosaur that happened to get stuck in the resin, and the DNA happened to be preserved. And the most, the trickiest, uh, the least probable is that you would find it. So while I think that we're likely to find good DNA, it's not likely to be dinosaur DNA. Right. Well, the, the good news is, the bad news is that we haven't found it. It's not likely to be a dinosaur from, D, from amber. The good news is that researchers in Jack's own lab have found what appears to be DNA directly from a Tyrannosaurus rex. So we do have a little bit of that genetic information. We're still a long way from bringing a dinosaur back to life. Well, if, if the question most on people's minds since seeing Jurassic Park is whether we can bring dinosaurs back to life, the question that used to be the most on the minds of boys and girls, at least by the questions I get, is how do you tell the boy dinosaurs from the girl dinosaurs? And this is my job to provide segues. There was one wonderfully provided here in that Sue Hendrickson, who provided the amber for this display that you just saw, these beautiful specimens, is also the namesake, the woman for whom Sue, the best Tyrannosaurus rex ever found, is named. She's the one who discovered that great T. rex. And Peter Larson dug it up, and through that T. rex and some other fossils that he examined, he's able to figure out a way, he thinks, uh, and it's quite convincing, that we can figure out just which are the boys and which are the girls when it comes to dinosaurs. So let Peter explain that. Uh, well, ever since we found the dinosaur, Sue, people started asking, well, did you call it Sue because it's a girl? As Don mentioned, we called the dinosaur Sue because of its discover. But that did bring up an interesting question. Is there a way to determine uh, which dinosaurs are male dinosaurs and which dinosaurs are females? Uh, looking through the literature, there's been some work done on that, but uh, particularly by a fellow by the name of Ken Carpenter from the Denver Museum, who spent a lot of time and thought that he had come up with some potential ways of telling that. Um, so we started uh, talking to modern, uh, or modern zoologists because, as, as we all know, we don't find dinosaur skin and dinosaur flesh, which have the reproductive organs preserved. And uh, in particular, I talked to a German colleague, Eberhard Frey, in, in West Germany, and uh, he had a way that he thought he could determine male crocodiles from female crocodiles. And with the help of my colleague next to me, Phil Curry, uh, who was looking at articulated skeletons, we think that we've come up with a way that will actually tell us by looking at a skeleton whether we're looking at a boy dinosaur and a girl dinosaur. And I've got a couple models here that may help illustrate this. This is uh, two pelvis and some of the tail vertebrae from Tyrannosaurus rex. The one on my right is uh, a model after Sue, and the one on my left is a model after the, the Tyrannosaurus rex that was collected by Jack's group at the Museum of the Rockies. And if you look very closely at this region of the tail in both models, you'll notice that uh, the specimen on my left, which I believe is a boy dinosaur, and the specimen on my right, which I believe is a girl dinosaur, are different. It seems as if uh, the boy dinosaur actually has an extra bone under its tail. Uh, it, it turns out that in crocodiles that this is tied in with the reproductive system of male dinosaurs. And so that the, the male dinosaur actually has an extra bone. And we think that we have uh, been able to demonstrate that this is going to work with dinosaurs. And our hope is to see a lot more specimens to see if we can tell then now, not just from a whole skeleton, but even from individual bones, what's the boy and what's the girl. Interestingly enough, it turns out that the female Tyrannosaurus rex is much larger and much more robust than the male sort of like birds of prey, like eagles, where the female uh, eagle is much larger than the male. Thank you, Peter. We're going to make a total switch here to something 
equally interesting and quite, quite different, and that is Jody Smith and his work. Jody does something called morphing. If you watch commercials, you've seen people transformed into other people. Uh, cats turn into cars, and you can also turn things into dinosaurs, and vice versa, as Jody will demonstrate. Jody. Thank you, Don. Uh, probably the most useful uh, purpose that we have for morphing right now is, as we've talked about uh, earlier today, we don't have very many dinosaurs uh, specimens available. Now with this morphing program we can take uh, a baby dinosaur and an adult dinosaur and morph them together and it'll give us as many steps in between as, as we would like to see, uh, which can can help us to visualize what the, the dinosaurs would look like at various ages. Some of the other uses that we have for morphing the dinosaurs uh, could be in morphing a dinosaur with its ancestor and visualizing the evolution proce evolutionary process that uh, may have taken place. And through the animation, we could see a time lapse uh, in a few seconds of a few million or a hundred million years, perhaps. Uh, we got a little tape we're going to roll here. This is a morph between an animated morph between a, a nestling and an adult. Uh, this one's a Hippacrosaurus. So you can see that the, the nestling is quite a bit smaller than, than the adult, and uh, there's some drastic shape changes that take place during the morph. This is a morph of a nestling myosaur into an adult. Now you can see the, there is quite a, a difference in size here also. And uh, you may be able to see on here that a lot of the ind individual bones, the seams in the bones, morph quite well uh, with this technique also. This one is, uh, <laughs> sorry Jack, I should have warned you about that. This is, uh, I decided to see what would happen if we morphed a mammal with a dinosaur. <laughs> well, thank you, Jody. Well, so we know if we want to bring dinosaurs back, we just take dinosaur paleontologists and turn them into dinosaurs. Well, well I'm fortunate to see that we have a number of questions that come in from our remote site. I'm sure there's some more that are in the audience here, but Let's take some of the ones that uh, people have sent us in through the network and see if we can get some answers for them. Uh, Kyle from Indiana, I think it's Kyansville, asks, how many types of dinosaurs there are? Phil. Uh, we know about 300 genera right now, and that sounds like a lot. After all, dinosaur names are long. 300 long dinosaur names is a lot to remember, but um, the bottom line is that when you start looking at what's uh, alive today, and we've got 8,000 species of birds alive, we've got 4,000 species of mammals, and we've got 6,000 species of reptiles and amphibians, and you start to realize that 300 species of dinosaurs stretched out, out over um, 150 or more million years is not very many at all. And uh, it's Difficult to estimate how many dinosaurs we don't know, uh, but we do know that there are literally thousands of dinosaurs out there still to be discovered. So with 300 dinosaurs known presently, we're, we're still at just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, in fact, uh, kids are finding dinosaurs all the time, and some have been named after kids. There was just one named in Australia this year after a, a little boy. And so uh, dinosaurs are being discovered at a rate Dr. Dotson calculates as one every seven weeks. So I hope you'll get out there and find some, if not in Indiana, someplace else. Now from Mark in Allisonville, we get a question, why didn't they rot in the ground? Peter. Now, most, 
most of them in fact did rot in the ground or on top of the ground and that's why we uh, why dinosaurs are, are rare uh, it's a very very unusual set of circumstances that allows a fossil to or an animal to be preserved as a fossil uh, mostly they have to be buried very rapidly so that as the flesh decomposes uh, the bones don't get decompose also so it's really rapid burial is the, the thing that helps preserve the animals now Ashley from Allisonville asks this is for Jack how long does it take an egg to hatch that's a very good question. I don't know the answer. You weren't there. <laughs> the incubation period of dinosaurs is not known. And as far as I know, we don't really have a very good way to figure that out either. Now, you do have a pretty good handle yourself on how fast some dinosaurs grew once they got out, right? Well, we, we, think, we think we can, we certainly have ways we think we can figure out how fast they grew, right? The uh, 18, the myosaur, 18 inches, hatching out at 18 inches, we believe, grew to three and a half feet in about three and a half to four weeks. So they grew at rates equivalent to birds. But the incubation period actually was probably pretty short. Uh, the eggs are relatively small, for certainly for the size of the animal. And obviously, the shortest period of time in the nest is the best. You want to get out of there for some reason? Hmm? If you're a dinosaur, you want to get out of that nest? Well, you want to get up, you want to grow as fast as you can. And as long as, as long as the parent dinosaur has to take care of the eggs, obviously the eggs are in danger from predators. We have any questions from the folks over here? Good. Right here. Oh, she's been waiting a long time, too. Yes, she has. If the dinosaurs were born funny, like if they had a crooked back or something, um, would you be able to tell if it was a dinosaur or not? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> in fact, one of the baby, one of the baby dinosaur, one of the baby myosaurs in a nest that we have, actually had a deformed foot. And if you've ever seen the story Maya, which is a children's book. There's a, actually a reference to crooked leg in there, and that is based on a real specimen. Maya is written by Dr. Jack Horner and James Gorman, published by Running Press. <laughs> I, don't get, I don't get a royalty, I'm sorry. Uh, further questions, yes? At what state did you find the most dinosaur bones at? At what state? At what state did you find the most dinosaur bones at? Okay, at what state? Oh, we can have an argument there. <laughs> <laughs> what state are the most dinosaur bones found at? Anyone want to try that one? Is it a state? No, we're a province, so. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a Canadian and American here. You remember that? Um, there's certainly a lot of riches anywhere in the. Um, Western states and provinces of Canada and the United States. So it depends very much on how much badlands exposure you have and how much effort you put into finding the dinosaurs. Uh, certainly in Canada, and one of the richest sites in anywhere in the world for that matter, is Dinosaur Provincial Park. And there are places in Dinosaur Park where you can't walk without stepping on bone. And probably in the United States, the, the, the state which has produced the most dinosaurs is Montana. But that's mostly because Jack Horner's out there looking. There's, there's uh, uh, South Dakota now is producing a lot of dinosaurs, and, and North Dakota, and uh, Colorado, uh, Utah, Wyoming. Traditionally, Wyoming has produced many, many dinosaurs. Uh, it's, uh, if you have sediments of the right age that were pr uh, produced on land, we can find dinosaurs there, and we just have to get out and look. And there's a lot more dinosaurs than there are dinosaur hunters. We just have to get more good dinosaur hunters. I think the, the statistic I saw in the book called The Dinosauria that scientists use is about 35 states out of 50 or even more now have produced dinosaur remains. So there's a good chance wherever you live there's a dinosaur somewhere around there. Yes? Except in Indiana. Except Indiana. <laughs> how, fast, how fast can a dinosaur run? One more time. How fast can a dinosaur run? Anybody hear that? How fast can a dinosaur run? Okay. How fast can a dinosaur run? The, the theropod dinosaurs are the fastest ones. Uh, we guess that from two lines of evidence. Number one, if you look at the hind legs of the dinosaur, you can 
calculate uh, how long the individual segments of the legs are, that is how long the lower leg is compared to the upper leg and, and how long the foot bones are. And then you make comparisons to modern animals like an ostrich. And if you have something like an ostrich mimic dinosaur, it's built much like a modern ostrich and we think it can probably run almost as fast. The other line of evidence is looking at dinosaur trackways. And uh, dinosaur trackways um, where you have left foot, left, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, and so on, you can measure the distance between the footprints and using a formula that was developed by a fellow in England and some modifications by other people, uh, you can actually calculate approximately how fast those dinosaurs were moving. Now the fastest dinosaur so far is from Texas and uh, it's going at about 40 kilometers per hour, but you have to remember that that's across soft mud and you never run your fastest across soft mud, so we think that even that dinosaur had capabilities of going much faster. So we think that the fastest dinosaur ran somewhere between 40 kilometers per hour, maybe 70 kilometers per hour. Okay, maybe remember more. that Phil is speaking Canadian, <laughs> and in, in American, that's 25 miles an hour or faster. And actually, the fellow who figured that, all that out is uh, an Indiana researcher, James Farlow. And he's one of the world experts on footprints and dinosaur speed. So when you see in Jurassic Park and they say that dinosaurs moved as fast as cheetahs, well, the evidence doesn't quite show that. We've got a lot more questions and a little bit more time for them later on in the broadcast. Right now we're going to check in with Lenore and see how the people who are working hard while we're playing are doing. Lenore. Hi, Don. Well, we're back at the middle school, and as you can see, we have an excellent looking dinosaur. These guys are really good artists. What we've done now is we've finished up our T-Rex for the most part. They're putting some of the final touches on it. And the, I think the fun part is they've actually added on flesh. They fleshed it out, as the artists call it, and they've turned our skeleton into a real dinosaur. And the science of paleontology has come a long way with the addition of artists helping them actually flesh it out. And thank God we had an artist here today to help us proportion it all. And this is uh, Joe Tipman, and he's going to talk about what he's done with some of his models. Joe? Uh, thank you. Uh, these are some of my models here. Uh, the skeleton is based on uh, the Tyrannosaurus rex, nicknamed Sue, from South Dakota. And I started with the, uh, with the skull. And when the skull was finished, I scaled the rest of the model to the skull. Uh, the kids and I talked about scale when we started laying out this T-Rex, so they know something about how that works. And we scaled this drawing basically the same way. We started off with a four-foot skull and uh, tried to scale quickly the rest of it to that. And I think we did a pretty good job, or these guys did a pretty good job. Uh, one of the things that artists do in in working with paleontologists is uh, we add flesh to the bones or to the skeleton, the skeletal models, and try and show people, scientists, what the dinosaur really looked like. And in doing that, we have a lot of study to do. We have to study where the muscles were attached to the bones. We have to figure out how to calculate how big they may have been, how bulky they may have been. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of complex information that goes into fleshing on a, a model like this. Uh, however, we seem to have a whole bunch of really good artists here that they did a real good job on this drawing. All right. So you get, do you have to study anatomy at all or work with muscle groups? Uh, it's a good idea to study anatomy and muscle groups. I'm still studying that stuff. I, uh, I can't get enough study time in. Uh, there's so much to learn, and there's a... Uh, I wish I could go back to school where these guys are at, and then I could take the time to study that stuff. Uh, I have too much to learn right now, but uh, with, great job. Really good. with the help of the scientists that I work with, I'll, I'll get accurate models on these. Okay. All right, great. Thanks a lot. What we're going to do now is talk to um, Dr. Peter Dodson, and he's been talking with some of the students, and we're going to sort of summarize what they might have learned today. Peter? Well, we had, we had a good time here. I'm really impressed. It looks like we got a dinosaur here, and two hours ago we didn't have a dinosaur. Uh, I have a Stephanie and Aaron and Albert, and uh, are you impressed? Yeah, I didn't think that we could do this good of a job. It looks pretty good. Yeah, what do you think, Aaron? Are you Stephanie? It is kind of hard because everybody kept stuff on the paper, but once you got done with it, it was easy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Aaron said. You know, I did, I never thought that we could do as good of a job as we did. But now, how many good. bones do you think there are in a Tyrannosaurus? Uh, a lot. I heard a lot. Yeah, there. Uh, how, who, who can guess? Like a, a thousand or something? Uh, I don't think there are a thousand. You think there are a thousand? Uh, Maybe possible. Probably. 
I don't know, but there's about 46 in the vertebrae. Yeah, a uh, couple. I'd, I'd say a couple hundred, couple hundred bones. And you know what? We we've got most of those bones in our own body. Most of those own uh, bones, the the femur and the tibia and the humerus and the, and the, all these, the the vertebrae, the ribs and all that. Are there any bones in Tyrannosaurus that we don't have in our bodies? The chevron. The chevrons. What's a chevron? It's underneath the vertebrae. It hangs underneath the vertebrae. Can you show me one? Let's see if we can find a chevron. There we go. Yeah, those are the bones underneath the tail. Of course, we don't have a tail, so I guess we don't have chevrons. Uh, Stephanie, what part of the dinosaur did you work on? I All right. Come on, come on over here and tell me about the tail. What's, what's interesting about this tail? What surprises you? It has 46 vertebrae, and I didn't think a tail had that much vertebrae. It's pretty long, isn't it? Yeah. You know, some dinosaurs had 80 vertebrae in the tail. Oh, that, That's a tail. So Tyrannosaurus is a bit of a wimp here. Yeah. Aaron, uh, what did you work on? Um, I worked on the hind leg. Oh, uh, what's good about the hind leg? Well, is it, the hind leg is really small. They're, they're not very long. So it's kind of interesting how it holds up as big a body as the Tyrannosaurus Rex has. So it holds a lot of weight because the hands don't doesn't really do much for keep holding the dinosaur up. Yeah, that's right. It, it was all all in two legs, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, what what did a Tyrannosaurus weigh? Oh, about two elephants. Two elephants, yeah, two two medium-sized elephants, six tons, twelve thousand pounds, and of course part of the time Tyrannosaurus was only in one leg, wasn't it? So. That's amazing. Albert, what did you work on? Well, um, I worked on the skull part over here. Um, uh, the skull has um, has a lot of um, holes in it. Uh, that way, you know, the dinosaur wouldn't be as heavy in the front because the hind legs had to hold up a lot. So um, it had uh, 15 teeth on the top and about the same amount on the on the bottom as the top. And, and that's on each side, so it would have been 60 teeth altogether. Yeah, around there. And those teeth are big, aren't they? Look at the size of that. Yes, Wouldn't want one of those sticking in you, would you? Oh, no. Oh, no, oh, no. Well, we did a great job with this. I'm really impressed with uh, how we went from, from nothing to something. I couldn't have done this, but with this, uh, with this nice group of artists here, we, we really did a good job. Okay, great, Peter. Well, thanks, everybody here. These guys are really great artists. I, I'm impressed. I didn't think we could do this. And like any good work of art, our artists here went and signed their picture. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Don. I guess we're finished here. And uh, unless you guys have some questions for us, we're going to uh, send it back to you. Thank you, Lenore. You did a great job, all the, all the students there. And clearly, you taught Peter and Dale some things about dinosaurs. Well, putting dinosaurs back together, as you found out, is, is hard work. And we obviously rely on artists in many ways to do that. Don Wolberg is with one of the uh, scientists who works with the artists at Dynamation in their attempt to bring dinosaurs back to life. Don. Hi, Don. I'm here with George uh, Callison, truly one of the premier artists in recreating the past. One of the goals of paleontology is to restructure what has happened in the past, sometimes from almost nothing. One of the uh, goals, of course, is to take parts and recreate a whole animal. George is going to explain to us a uh, newer a technique that is extremely interesting and probably accurate as well. George? Thanks, Don. We're really fortunate to live in a time when so much is known about dinosaurs. We've heard today about so many different things that tell us about the life and the times of dinosaurs. And one of the things that we've learned is that they really were alive. And they're the kinds of animals that had some very, very unusual peculiarities some that are very difficult to predict. And one of the things that the company that I work for, which is Dynamation International, we're responsible for doing things like uh, robot, robotizing dinosaurs. And behind me is one of those kinds of models. It's an animated sculpture, essentially, showing one of the facts of life, and that is that animals have to, have to eat to live. All animals are adapted to capturing energy by eating. And this happens to be Deinonychus, a creature that was discovered by John Ostrom, whom you've seen. And this creature is one that's been produced by a whole team of individuals working with the information that Dr. Ostrom and some of his colleagues have produced, and still other individuals as well. And from this effort, 
the uh, planners, the sculptors, the machinists, the engineers, the fabricators, the plastic specialists, and the educators have all teamed to produce one of these kinds of creatures. These creatures are used to get people excited about coming into museums and zoos and nature parks all around the world. I'd like to uh, tell you more about this by introducing you to a videotape, which we'll just run right now. I'm Dr. George Callison. I work as senior science advisor at Dynamation International, the people who built the wonderful robotic dinosaurs in this exhibit. A lot of people ask me about the process of building a robotic dinosaur. To be honest, it's kind of hard to explain. That's why Dynamation has put together this short video that brings you into the Dynamation factory to see how we bring these prehistoric beasts to life. You'll see and hear Dynamation's own artists and engineers taking you step by step through this exciting process. Join me now as we go behind the scenes to see Dynamation's dinosaurs alive and in color. The process of creating life-size animated dinosaurs involves the talents of dozens of people at Dynamation International. Buried fossils tell us only half the story of what these awesome creatures looked like and how they acted. The rest is left to our imagination. Dynamation's team of scientists, artists, and engineers has bridged this gap between fact and fantasy by building robotic restorations of some of the world's most ancient and most interesting inhabitants. Dynamation's dinosaurs. Alive and in color. Dynamation has always started with the, the original documents, that is the bones. And the scientist takes those bones and makes them a document in three dimensions that can be read by anybody. You can read a bit of the story of prehistoric life from this. I have to keep in mind that this sculpture has to function as a robot. It must uh, be scientifically accurate. I have to bring it in on time. And I still try to dig deep and come up with something that's unique every time. Each step of this creative process is carefully monitored for scientific accuracy. After all, Dynamation's mission is to educate as well as entertain. The end goal is to make the creatures seem as realistic and lifelike as possible. I think it's important to realize that our final product is the result of a lot of teamwork. A lot of creative people bringing a lot of different skills, yet each one of these people is concerned about building a high quality product. Hopefully our exhibits appeal to children of all ages. The exhibits themselves should be visually exciting but should also teach the visitors something about the world around them and make them more sensitive to that world.
thank you all for that presentation. I should point out, uh, in the sense of fair play, that Dynamation's goal and that of other robotic dinosaur makers is to educate, entertain, and to make money, which they do very well. Uh, the, the purpose of this uh, wonderful get-together DinoFest is to educate and entertain. And the purpose of dinosaur science and the research that these people that you see before you do all their lives is to educate and entertain and not to make money. And that is really what we're here to celebrate. Uh, I'm not a particular fan of robotic dinosaurs as well as uh, they try to put them together. Dynamation and their competitors are making rather half-sized clunky versions of spectacular, wonderful, once-living animals. But they're doing their best because we so much want to see dinosaurs alive. All of us really want to know what they were like. And that's one reason, a big reason, that movie Jurassic Park was so popular. It wasn't a chance to see Laura Dern making goo-goo eyes at uh, Jeff Goldblum. It was a chance to see real dinosaurs and just how we can imagine them alive again. And I've been asked to briefly summarize what we've talked about here today. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about the impossibility of bringing dinosaurs back to life. But we've talked about the possibility of discovering an awful lot from the few fragmentary clues that we have. And we do that because we have this tremendous curiosity about dinosaurs, because we have devoted people with a lot of ingenuity who are able to do that. So we can't answer that question, can we bring dinosaurs back to life yet? We don't know the answer. We can answer another question, which um, I didn't quite pose, but I hope you've been wondering about all this time, is how come Jack Horner didn't graduate college? <laughs> and <laughs> the answer, <laughs> putting him on the spot, the answer is clearly not that the, he wasn't smart. He's a very smart fellow. It's not that he was hard, wasn't hardworking, because he's a very hardworking guy. The answer was that he had a reading disability called dyslexia that wasn't diagnosed in those days. These days, most of you go to school and people check out and see how you're doing in your reading and your writing, everything else, and if you have a problem, they try and fix it. Well, that wasn't always the case. And Jack worked very hard against those odds to become a great scientist. And I think one of the lessons to take away from here is that there's a lot more to be found out about dinosaurs or whatever else interests you, and that you have the capacity to make that happen. You can make it happen in school, you can make it happen on your own, and you can make it happen right now in your lives. And I hope you'll come away from this get-together with not only a new interest in dinosaurs, but a new interest in what you guys can find out for yourselves. And we have a lot of questions to answer here. We're not going to be able to answer them all. We're going to try and take some more from here and from the remote places. But you're going to have to go out and find the answers yourselves in the end. So that's what we hope you'll do when you leave here. Let's start with one question before I get to some more from the audience that's come from a long way. And now, having picked on Jack, let me reward him, because this is a question from Pryor, Montana. Travis wants to know, what is the first dinosaur, and I guess he means the earliest dinosaur, that we know about? Is that a Euraptor? Euraptor? Will we all, <clears throat> all agree on this one? Yeah. Euraptor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's a hard question, because it depends on how you define a dinosaur. Well, how do you define a dinosaur? Well, I can't do that. People keep changing their definitions. <laughs> if you want to find an older dinosaur, all you have to do is redefine it. <laughs> well, now we know how old was it? Wicked old? How old? What? How old is Eoraptor? What is it? Two? 235? 235, 240, somewhere. 235. 235 200, million. 235 million years ago. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's an old dinosaur. <laughs> no, it's not in kilometers, that's <laughs> it was moving very slowly. Eoraptor means dawn hunter. was named by Paul Serino, University of Chicago. It's uh, about the size of a dog, and it was a nasty meat eater, I think. Uh, one more for Jack. Sorry, this is from Mike. Jack, are you coming back to Pryor? Yes. What did you find when you were there? Uh, we actually we. It was sort of interesting. Uh, John Ostrom collected in 1964, collected uh, the five skeletons of Deinonychus. And this last summer, we went back in to see if there was anything left at that quarry. And we took out parts of a skeleton. And we're going to go back again to see if we can find what's left. Neat. So yes, we are going back to Pryor. Good. Can we come with you? <laughs> How many of you? <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's take some questions from the kids here. How did you come up with the name dinosaurs? Someone want to tackle that? How did the name dinosaurs first get named? Well, back in about 1841, 
a fellow by the name of Richard Owens uh, decided that these animals were not exactly the same as other reptiles and, this, and decided that uh, dino uh, sore for ter terrible lizard appeared to be a good uh, explanation when what we had at that point were Megalosaurus, which were uh, these uh, carnivorous, uh, large carnivorous dinosaurs, and so terrible does it seem to be a very appropriate name. I should em emphasize that the name dinosaur came, uh, was developed 17 years after Mantrell uh, found the first, or his wife, found the first uh, dinosaur in England. It's so this, the animals were found before uh, somebody figured out what to call them. Right. And just because they're called terrible lizards doesn't mean they were lizards, and it doesn't mean they were all terrible. Most of them were plant eaters and probably quite nice. And while we're at Jurassic Park, I did bring along a little prop. This is the real Velociraptor's claw. So among the other things we're finding out wasn't so in the movie, that dinosaur was not as big as a person, and this was the size of its killer claw. Have you ever had to look underwater for a dinosaur? One more time. Fossils. Have you ever had to look underwater for a dinosaur fossil? Anyone looked underwater for dinosaur fossils? Jack sites have gone underwater. Certainly, some yeah. of my sites have gone underwater, <laughs> and uh, I've actually had to excavate dinosaur footprints that were under a couple of feet of water. I think you nearly uh, went under yourself once. Huh? No, yeah, I definitely went under myself. <laughs> 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 Slipped out of the boat. <laughs> of course, dinosaurs died on land, but their bones get washed into water too. How can you tell the difference between a dinosaur bone and a rock? How do you tell the difference between a dinosaur bone and a rock? Peter? Um, a dinosaur bone will still show the structure that that animal had when it was alive. Uh, I guess one of the things that many people don't understand today is that those dinosaur bones are still bone. Many times the cell spaces are filled with, with minerals, but that's still bone. So if you look at the inside of a modern bone, after you finish a steak and you can see the structure of the bones that are left in that uh, from your meal, uh, you can see what a dinosaur bone looks like inside too. There's another way to tell and that's to taste it. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not entirely kidding. This is shown to me by a dinosaur hunter. If you ever eat a potato chip and your mouth is real dry and it sticks to your tongue, well, it's all the little holes in the potato chip that are sticking to your tongue. Well, in dinosaur bone or in anybody's bone, there's lots of holes inside. If you were solid all the way through and through, you'd be kind of heavy, it'd be tough to move around. Dinosaurs the same way, there are lots of holes. So if you stick your tongue on a dinosaur bone, it's more likely to stick than it would to a rock. So you can go around tasting the rocks and see if they're dinosaur. What is the plate on their head for? What is the? What is the plate on some dinosaurs, he dinosaurs heads for? The plate on their heads. What, well, they've got lots of different ornaments on their heads, and maybe Jack could tell us about that. Well. I, you mean like Triceratops, the horn dinosaurs? Plates. Well, we got crested dinosaurs. You mean like, like the dome-headed dinosaurs or the armored dinosaurs. Some of well, some things, some things on the heads of dinosaurs were probably for defense, to keep other dinosaurs from biting their head. But animals like Triceratops and some of the horned dinosaurs probably had things on their head for display so they could attract their mates. They did, too. Yeah, the duckbill dinosaurs also. Another question. Does that answer your question? What was the longest dinosaur that lived? The longest dinosaur? No, how long did? What was the lifespan, the longest lifespan of a dinosaur? Okay, anybody know that? We don't know the answer to that. We don't know how long they lived. Big animals do live a long time, but who knows? Now, you, we're gonna have a, a lot more questions that we're gonna have time to answer. We're pretty much running out of time here. So let me suggest one alternative, if I can, for getting some answers, besides looking them up yourself, which would be the best way. And that is you can write to the Dinosaur Society, which is my plug here. It's a charity, a nonprofit that a lot of us are involved in. It raises money for dinosaur research for which there's very little these days. It tries to do things for education, particularly for kids. It publishes this newspaper called Dino Times every month. It's all the news that's old. And answers that kids have 
about dinosaurs and questions that kids have about dinosaurs are to be found in the Dino Times. And you can find out information about the Dinosaur Society by writing to the Society at 200 Carlton Avenue, East Islip, New York, 11740, or by calling 1-800-DINO-DON. Um, let, let me take another moment to put in a plug for the people who are most responsible for making this happen. Uh, we all owe a great debt to Gary Rosenberg and Don Wahlberg. They've worked very hard in short order to put this event together, and it's really been an exceptional event. This is the, perhaps the first time anyone's ever thought to put dinosaur researchers, educators, artists, preparators, collectors together with the public, educators and, and students alike, and figure out what we all know about dinosaurs. And that's something wonderful that we can all celebrate about this event. So thank you all for coming, and we hope we can do this again real soon. has been a production of the Office of Integrated Technologies at Indiana University, Purdue University, and Indianapolis.